There are kids that fall through the cracks. There are kids that maybe are not graduating, dropping out of school. They have the attendance issues. They may have the behavior issues. And simply because once they leave the structure of the school, their lives are not something that allow them to be successful here without knowing that they exist. Sixteen hours and 49 minutes from school ending one day to school starting the next for some kids may be the longest hours of their entire lives. The biggest issue for, for kids, especially for school-age kids, is it's almost impossible to concentrate and focus on school. There are, you know, homeless folks in class with your child. You, you just can't pick them out. One of the things that community needs are more places for families and for our adult students or older students who don't have a place to stay. Love. Main thing that teenagers need is love. I'm a counselor at the high school. I'm also the homeless coordinator for the school district of Lloyd. I meet the needs of the students here, their social needs, their emotional needs, their academic needs. I believe it was two to three years ago um, as I worked with teenagers, the more I saw, I still really didn't connect it with the homeless piece. Just knew that I was dealing with a lot of kids that were struggling or kicked out from their parents and things like that. And um, started collaborating and looking for teen shelters again. So really that was the only thing in mind. I didn't know anything about McKinney-Vento. I didn't really um, know that there was a federal law that protected kids or that might provide services for them. We started looking for what grants are out there and it just so happened that the McKinney-Vento grant was available and I really looked at it as an opportunity to possibly pursue what I thought was going to be, oh my gosh, maybe we can get shelter for these kids finally and things like that. As it unfolded and I, and I learned what it was about myself, it became so much more. And as now for the first year in our school district, we're actively identifying kids. It has opened my eyes to so much more of their struggle, even more than I had ever possibly imagined. When I go and talk to a group about homelessness, it's, I worry that they're going to feel like it's a hopeless situation and I, I really want to make sure that people know that people can come back from homelessness and teens can finish their education. Sometimes we have to provide them with support so that they can do that, but they can finish and they can go on and they can have a better life. Kayla Brown is now a senior. She is a 19-year-old senior that um, really has struggled a lot throughout her entire adolescence and probably a lot of her childhood as well. Um, there's been mental health issues in her home, um, physical issues with the one parent that she did reside with for a while. Um, and what quite often what happens with our kids or Kayla Brown also is when they're in these living situations, they become the caregivers rather than taken care of. And in Kayla's situation, she became the caregiver to where um, in her situation, mom would want her to stay home rather than her coming to school. And she didn't have the stability or she had to live with the threat of if she stepped out of line, if there was an argument, she was going to be put out on the street. And she lived under that constant threat and quite often was. My story begins when I started out as 17, going on 18 years old. On my 18th birthday, a week later, my mom kicked me out the house. I walked around for about three hours trying to find somewhere to go, and it was below zero. I was walking around with a purse and two outfits. The rest of my clothes stayed there. I told her that I would come back whenever I found somewhere to settle in. I had to find somewhere to go, which was my aunt's house. The living room was my bedroom. Staying with my aunt was very difficult 
knowing if she was going to be anything like my mom, out of the blue, want to kick you out. At my mom's house, we struggled to make food. It was like you had to grab whatever was there and put it together. Not knowing where you're going to rest your head the next morning, the next night, whenever, whenever you're going to get a meal, it was very difficult. It gets very hard to see how somebody can sit there and tell you that they love you, daughter, I love you, son, and they can sit there and throw you out the next day. She tells me all the time that she loves me, and the main thing I ask her every time she kicks me out is, how can you sit there and say, I love you, and you kick me out? What it is, is it's a huge disruption to not having your kids need system structure and routine um, and they need stability and without that stability without knowing that you have a roof over your head and food on the table um, without knowing that you're going to be in a safe and secure environment you are constantly going to worry about that so if you're worried about where you're going to sleep that night if you're worried about where your next meal is going to come from if you're worried about your safety those are those basic need issues food clothing shelter if you're worried about that it's really hard to move beyond that and think about my homework assignment or think about socializing and getting involved with friends or think about connecting in the community um, those basic needs and trying to get those basic needs essentially dominate everything else. I got kicked out of the house three times from my mom. I ended up in foster care twice due to her and her alcohol and her drugs that she abuses herself with. Yeah, that's a very, very tough situation when you have someone that you carry under your ribs and gave birth to them and how can you sit there and say, well, you know what, I don't want you to has been hard to concentrate on schoolwork because I have to think about are they going to get sick and tired of me one day and tell me to pack my stuff up and get out? Do I have to worry about my stuff being out of the room and hearing the words, Kayla, I'm sorry to tell you this, I'm not trying to be mean, and I'm not trying to be nothing like your mom, but you're going to have to leave. My oldest son, who's 27, would bring friends home, and some of those friends would end up living with us for a while. Um, you know, some of them were thrown out of their homes. Some of them were 18-year-olds uh, with hardly any option at all. And so my wife and I got involved in trying to help them, encourage them, give them a vision for what they could become. We've had personal experience with those kinds of uh, situations, and they're very sad. So I've seen the younger end of them, and uh, you know, I hate watching the younger end of them. Corey Winters was a 17-year-old junior that attended school here. He came from Oshkosh, I believe, and he was in a situation there where um, kind of like an inner city type setting where um, there was a lot of violence, um, there was shooting in his neighborhood, things like that. I think his mom wanted him to get out to hopefully have a future for himself. I think what was difficult is he left young siblings behind, so he's been torn. It was very difficult for him to be here and feel like he needs to be there being the man of the house. And he excelled academically. And for, for the little bit, he was able to come to school because, again, he was in a situation where people took him in. So he couch surfed with this particular family. It wasn't his home. So he pretty much had to live in a way that he can't, you know, really screw up or get comfortable or um, that sort of thing. He did end up um, getting a girl pregnant, which complicated his life even more. Um, I would say he was easily a 3.5 uh, grade point average. He had potential to go very, very far, and I still hope he does. Um, he did go back home just recently. He did feel the need to go back with his mom, um, and I believe he is back, and I think what we'll do is we'll see him come back and forth. What I'm afraid of 
for Corey is that his education will get lost as he goes back and forth. We were staying with somebody else. We were staying with my uncle and his girlfriend. So, like, whenever they would start fighting, she would pretty much threaten to kick us out. And so, like, I was in school. I was just starting to get comfortable. I was just starting to, like, get to know everybody. I met my girlfriend for the first time, the one that's pregnant right now. We started doing good. And then, like, every time they fought, I'd feel pressured. I'd hate going to school. I'd go to school tired because I'm up wondering all night whether or not I'm gonna have to leave without saying bye to somebody. Before I started having stress and stuff, I had maintained a 3.0 average. I still started getting worse. I went from 3.0 to like 2 point, and then like to 1.5. And I guess when I try to tell it to my mom, she doesn't understand what I go through. What do you feel like? You feel like you're by yourself. It's like you're the only person in the world that's going through this. You, like, you're just weird. You're not human. You're just there. And like, none of your friends act the way they used to. But they might come and try to talk to you, but then they don't understand what you're going through. I just want somebody to just look at it, try to relate to it. If not, take what I'm saying and use it to help themselves and do good off of it. A lot of insecurity, um, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. Um, again, a lot of times the kids, if it's a family situation, the kids feel just as responsible to try to help take care of everybody. If it is one of our unaccompanied youth situation, it truly is where am I going to be staying tonight. Um, don't really probably care so much about that homework assignment I got because I don't have a way to do it anyway. Um, where am I going to be staying the next day? What if um, the abuse of, there might be an abusive parent or domestic violence going on finds me or tries to get me back? What if the police get me? You know, they deal with all sorts of um, stressors that are out there. Quite often we have kids in our school and if there's ever a chance to be out here, when that bell rings, when when you're young and you're a child, you think, oh my gosh, bell rang, running out the door as fast as you can. We have so many kids that linger around that our halls look as full as they do when we open the doors in the morning. There are so many kids that don't want to go home because they just may not have a place to call home. This story was shared with me um, by a man who is involved with the HEAT group uh, trying to provide shelter for our unaccompanied youth. He told me that he was on an interviewing committee for a scholarship through the Rotary Club and asked a young woman who was a four point plus student, very accomplished woman, young woman, um, why there was no address on her application. And she said, that she was sleeping in a car, that her dad had left the family when she was a toddler and her mom was involved with drugs and she felt that it was safer and better for her to be living in the car. Um, and he can't tell that story without a catch in his voice. So many of our young people are struggling and have such potential. It's something that we need to be able to support. We need to, to invest in our young people. Um, we have one of the hardest things for me is when I get a call from uh, a young person who has no place to go that night and I can't tell them that there's a place that they can go. Right now there's no place for 16 and 17 year olds who are on their own to go. There's no safe place for them and I have to say I'm sorry I can't help you. And I don't know what happens to those students many times. Quite often people have a stigma about who homeless people actually are and what homeless people look like. It's a guy who's a drunk or a drug addict and they're just hanging out on the street and they don't. Um, 
I think people would be interested to know that at any given time in this country, 40% of all the homeless people in this country are children under the age of 17. I think that is a glaring statistic. It, it changes the face of who we think is homeless. Um, it is not just, it is not what we normally think. It's young families with children. It's um, people who have been displaced because they've lost their jobs. Um, there was a circumstance we had recently at our shelter where a woman who had, you know, her, her, she and her husband had been middle class. She was a nurse and her husband was, uh, was working as well. They both were, he had retired, he had gotten really ill, their bills built up, he, he passed away, she couldn't afford their house and she was still working. She was actually living in shelter and going to her nursing job every day. So it is, the idea of who we sometimes think is homeless is not really the case. That number speaks volumes to me. At any given time, as many as 40% of all people who are homeless in this country are children under the age of 17. I remember one situation where uh, the female student I had last year, uh, you know, she was in my productions, and I try and keep a close tabs on their grades while they're in my productions, and making sure they have a 2.0 GPA and everything. And I went up to her one day and I said, hey, um, I noticed your grades are slipping. And I mean, she just absolutely exploded. Um, yelled at me uh, for even checking on her. Did you understand where it was coming from? At the time, no. I had no idea at the time. I mean, I knew she was struggling, but I thought that she was, um, you know, she had been living with a friend for a while, so I thought that she was at least stable there. It, it didn't seem like that was going, that was the problem, you know, because I came to her about her grades, and, you know, and she was a top student. I mean, it's not like she was in basket weaving. She was in calculus and, and AP English and I mean she was a high achieving student. Driven after she calmed down and we, we just, you know, she came back um, to rehearsal and we rehearsed and then after the rehearsal she revealed to me um, Her friend's parents were kicking her out. Do you think kids in her situation would rather be invisible? Do you think part of her explosion on you was she didn't want to be visible to you? Yeah, she didn't want people to know. I mean, they certainly don't want people to know. And she was a senior, and she was so close. I mean, she's months away from graduating. And she had applied to all these colleges, and... Uh, lots of promise, and she just needed to get through the school year, you know, and it's tough, see, it's tough seeing someone struggle like that, and <clears throat> she was not getting kicked out because of anything she did. Uh, her friend's parents decide, uh, determined that they just couldn't afford to have her there. So. Some people may think like, oh, you don't know nothing about the streets. Yeah, I do. It's rough. You know, I've, I've slept outside. You know, I've had to do things for money that, you know, I ain't, I ain't proud of. You know what I'm saying? It's, people might find it's cool, but no, it's not. <laughs> it's just it's just getting me by. And I'm tired of just trying to get by. I, I want to make this work. I had a pretty good life, you know. I was raised in, uh, on Copeland, actually 1869 Copeland Avenue. 
It's a greenhouse. You know, I live with there with my mom, my dad, my sister, my uncle Troy, my uncle Robbie. Until the time I was about two, my mom had an affair on my dad. So my dad, I wouldn't call it kidnap, but parent napped me supposedly from my mom's house when I was about two years old. So she tried taking him to court. She didn't show up for the court dates. So the judge right then and there gave my dad full custody of me. I lived with my dad probably to the age of about 10. You know, he had a lot of girlfriends. So it's nobody really that was just like too important to the, about the time I was probably about six or seven, probably going on seven, I met Debbie. And that was my dad's everything, I guess, you know. So I never seen him act that way with another woman. And, you know, I thought maybe she would be the one that I could finally look up to and do things with. And, you know, she was a great mom. She didn't have no kids of her own. You know, she treated me like the world, you know, her own son. I had everything, you know, I had my own room. She bought me everything. My dad was, didn't work at the time, so it was just her. And then, about the time I was about nine years old, things started going rough with them. And, you know, it was always arguing. You know, my dad would come into my room and sleep instead of sleeping in the bed with her. Um, you know, just one, one day out of the blue, I just got woke up, told me I needed to get my stuff and pack everything. It was about two in the morning. You know, I had to go sit inside a cop car while my dad and Debbie argued about who was going to keep me, but the police ended up taking me with my dad, but my dad left me at my grandma's house for about a couple of months. And then one day he called me and told me that he did something bad. And I didn't know exactly what he was talking about. I tried asking him what, but he hung up the phone. I went to school a couple of days later. I was probably about fifth grade. And uh, I got pulled out by the principal. You know, at the time I, was, I wasn't the best kid, so I thought I, was, I did something bad. But they took me in the library. And there was a detective there and two other officers. And, you know, they just started asking me questions about my dad. You know, have I seen him? Do I know where he might be at? Um, his relationship with Debbie, and, you know, at the time I didn't know what the hell was going on, you know? Just answering questions just like it was anything else. And, you know, at, at the end of it, everything, they told me that uh, they found my stepmom murdered. And, you know, at the time I, I, I didn't know what to think. You know, I never seen anything like that. The police officers dropped me off at my, my grandma's house and, uh, when I left my grandma's house because they left me there, you know, I didn't know what else to do. So I walked to the old house where we was living on Park Avenue. And they didn't exactly clean everything up. And it was kind of sad to see everything how it was. Like, there was blood marks from the tile floor going into the carpet. There was blood all the way going up the stairs. And it's just, you know, it's it pretty sad, you know. So the two years my dad sat in county, uh, I was never able to see him. You know, he wrote me, but he shipped him off to prison, and I don't know. I, I didn't really ever want to try to talk to him. But while I was living at my mom's house, things started getting really bad. You know, my, uh, her husband at the time beat up my little brothers, and they had a bruised kidney and things, and he went to jail. Then a couple uh, a week after, you know, he came back, and... Things weren't all too well, especially with me and my sister. Like, why would you take him back? He just beat up on your, your, your two youngest. You know, is he really worth it? And he stayed. So that kind of proved to me that he, you know, we would thought of last. And that was just the last thing for me. So I packed up my stuff one day and I ran away. The uh, biggest programming that I've worked on over and over and over again is, is creating mentor programs. To connect a child with a responsible caring adult makes a difference in their attendance, in their grades, in their behavior, in their attitude. It really brings them to another level because they matter to somebody. And for some kids, that's the first person they ever mattered to. Unconditional love and support. 
I mean, more than anything else. You know, someone that'll listen to them. The thing that always makes the difference for that child is having that role model having that adult, having that connection, having that person that is there for them. What we're looking for is host homes, safe homes, people, very kind people who have an extra bedroom, who are willing to open up their homes and allow our young people to stay there while we figure out, can they go back home? Where can they be safe and stable? That is, it's a tremendous uh, gift you can give a kid to give them a safe place to be and an ear to listen to. What they really need is a support network. You know, they need, they need parents, they need, um, or at least, you know, adult guidance and role models and, you know, people they can turn to, it's just. And I don't always have the answers or know what to do, but I will find the answers and I'll ask somebody else what to do. But they know that um, I'm here to serve them. I think that's how the kids see me too. It gets very, very tough thinking about all that stuff that you have to sit there and worry about and not knowing where you want to eat, where you want to sleep, when's the next time you're going to be able to bathe yourself, when's the next time that you're going to have any money in your pockets, making the next phone call to any family members, when's the last time you're going to hear your parents' voice or your kids' voice or whatever. Do you have trust issues? Lots. Like when people say I'm paranoid, maybe I am. But like when they used to steal stuff back in the days when I was little, I don't want that to happen again. And now I got to a point where now I'm big like them and I can fight them back. But I got like three locks on my door at home. I don't want any of my stuff to be taken. Like I'm constantly in fear of getting robbed when I'm at home and you shouldn't have to go through that. It's just crazy. You don't want to be known for fighting. You want to be known for who you are. Who are you? I don't even know anymore. I'm telling you the truth. My words for people that are like me is don't give up. And people that are trying to get you down, leave them the hell alone. They're not good for you. People that are positive and, and trying to do things with you and for you, keep them in your life. Because, believe me, they'll, they'll be the ones to be there at the end, helping you out and just making everything just better. <laughs> you know, you think you, you, you had a, your worst day ever, you just want to give up or, you know, think thoughts that you shouldn't think. Think about how, how they would feel if you were gone. You know, think about how they would feel if you was just to disappear. There's a perception out there that our unaccompanied youth, our teens who are homeless, are kids who aren't worthwhile in some way. Kids who are using drugs, kids who are very troubled or violent kids. The reality is that those kids exist as well as those kids who are living in a car and pulling up a four point plus. Kids who want to go to college, kids who have left home because it's so bad at home it would be better to sleep in a car. It's really important that folks see that our kids who are homeless are, are a wide range of kids. It's not just kids who are troubled who, who perhaps some folks think there's no hope for. It's kids who have so much potential and can contribute to our society as adults if we give them just that little boost. I have this vision of displaced youth um, being engaged in a year-round school camping program. They live on site, they go to school on site, they have their shelter taken, taken care of, faculty and staff live on site. In an ideal world, I would set up a facility where we're taking kids in so that they know their basic needs are met, they know that they're in a nurturing environment, and we can also focus and concentrate on their academic prowess and their futures. But it's setting up a space where kids who are displaced, kids who are who have had to leave their families for whatever reason, abuse, neglect, whatever issues going on at home, that they have a safe and nurturing environment to come to with caring adults and positive role models that we can follow through and work with them until adulthood.
and get them into being productive members of society. That's kind of, if I could do anything, if somebody gave me a, an endless pot of money, that is the thing I would do. The needs are so great, and it's not just the needs of the kids, which I attend to. I do a lot of crisis management here, and I try to provide resources or steer them in the right direction or take care of them in a way that I can as far as support or comfort, but I'm not able to reach the families, which I think is even more important to help create that stable environment again is to really start working with the families. The other thing that is the biggest challenge is we have no teen shelter. And without having a transitional place to know that I have stable, safe places for these teenagers to go, um, I'm constantly in fear of losing them. Love. That's it. That's all, I was, that's all I've ever wanted, is just somebody to just love me back and be proud of me. <laughs> you know, I miss my mom about my graduation, and uh, she told me that she's happy for me, but she's not going to it, so. Even if I was a part of building whatever it is that they planned on building, like if they were to plan on making a big old building for all the homeless children, I would want to be a part of that. And that's my main thing. I would really want that. I wouldn't want nobody to experience any half the things that I went through. I wouldn't want them to experience half of it because it makes no sense for them to.